Wherever the next menu is. Still wants to reverse them. Okay, go like that. Okay, folks. Whoa, that's loud. For those of you still in the room uh, from the last session, we do have a session starting like right now, another session for ECRIT. So you're welcome to join us. Although we'll probably force you into taking notes. So if you're here for ECRIT, we'll start here in just a minute. I feel like people should not be allowed to sit like, on, on all sides. Like, I think, I think, I think we should, I think we should be friends with each other and kind of cluster in the middle. Can you guys, can you guys come be our friend over here? I guess it's just weird. If you're like. <laughs> So we'll get started like 30 seconds after somebody volunteers to take notes and we get a jabber stride. Wow, I'm overwhelmed. I'm sorry? Uh, Roger is going to join virtually, I believe. He's going to try. If that's possible. Don't everybody volunteer at once for Jabber Scribe and Nut Taker? Can somebody take some notes for us? Krista, that I was looking at you because that might make the meeting faster. Oh, yeah, just try and capture the sense of what's going on in the room. You know, title of the presentation and what's being talked about, right? Or major topics. Do we have a backup note taker so we can merge the two? And it's not a hard job. It's just something to do, keeps you off of email while the meeting's going on. So welcome to ECRIT, IETF 96, five. Why is it? Ah, the slides are wrong. It's IETF 96 and we are not in Buenos Aires. Roger, if you're listening, thank you. So I'm Mark Lindsner, co-chair. Roger Marshall is, is attempting to join us virtually if he hasn't already joined. This is the note well. Uh, hopefully you've read this and you understand that contributing, how to contribute to the IETF and what, what your responsibilities are in this area. Our agenda today, we're gonna talk for about five minutes, um, bashing the agenda. 
So if, if you see anything up here uh, you don't like, we're going to hear from Brian on uh, data only emergency calls, validation of locations around plan changes and in the extension to return complete and similar info. Now we took those three documents and actually put them in working group last call this week, but we thought it would be good to get let Brian state what he's made in the latest changes because I believe he just updated them recently. So he's going to talk about those updates and then you'll have comment or, you'll, or have the ability to comment in here. Uh, and then of course, working group last call, please, you know, review them intensely uh, and, and comment on the list. Well, I mean, we'll capture your comments in here and treat them as, you know, working group last call to comments. Then we have uh, two presentations from Randy on uh, uh, in vehicle emergency calls and Pan American e-call. Uh, and those will probably take the majority of the time. And then we got a few minutes at the end. It's an hour meeting. So is there anybody wants to throw rocks at the agenda? No? Okay. Document status, additional data related to emergency calls in the RC editor queue. Um, we talked about next generation vehicle initiated emergency calls in Pan American. We believe they're real close, ready to go to the IESG. Uh, there's been a lot of comments on the lists in the authors and in those commenters are, are working those issues out now and we'll listen to that shortly. And these are the three documents that where we started working group last call this week on and data only emergency lost extensions and validation of location. So milestones, we moved those out uh, to November. Our aggressive schedule was March but we moved those out to November. And while doing that, we discovered an error. Uh, they were listed on the milestones, the e-call, um, right, the Pan American e-call and the in-vehicle emergency calls are both listed as informational. I believe they're in the drafts as standards-based. We, the chairs, believe that was just a error on our part. We fat-fingered that when we put them in originally. If there's anybody has causes any pain for anybody, please let us know. Uh, in other words, if you thought those drafts are going to be informational, and now we're we've announced they're going to be standards based, if that causes you any concern, please he speak now or on the list like shortly. Uh, Brian Rosen, the the intended status on the documents has always been proposed standard, so. This is your problem. Please fix your problem. But intended, the intended status on all the drafts has been proposed standards. Right, and and I'm I'm taking the blame for that. I'm just stating if that's causing anybody else any grief, please speak now or forever hold your peace. So, so if you can just ask that question on the list and give okay. people a couple of days in case they they have anything to bring up, but otherwise we'll consider it a mistake and we'll fix it. Okay. So if we could oh, capture that in the Sorry. notes, the, the chairs will send this issue to the list for the question. So these are our milestone updates. If anybody has any comments on that, you know, that's we've sent that message to the list also. In hopefully November 2016 is is good. We'll we'll talk about the working group probably at the end of this meeting a little bit about the status of ECRIT and where it's going. So. Uh, Brian Rosen, those are good if we get reviews. Those are good if we get, right, that's true. So, let me go find Brian's presentation here. Which one are you doing first, Dayton? Yeah. You gonna have enough time for these slides? Hmm? Um, so data only is a way to send a message that contains all the information you would find in an invite um, and you use this when there is no real-time media. There is no difference between sending an invite as an emergency call and sending a message as an emergency call except that you wouldn't have STP and set up a, a session with, with, um, with media. So the example here is an alarm, right? An alarm goes off, you send a message, it's got all the same data that would be in an invite, gets routed like a any other emergency call, so if you're in service SOS and the, and the request URI and a route that you get from the lost server and, the, and, the, and a route header, and it does exactly the same thing, but it 
um, doesn't set up a media. Um, there's a, a request to uh, deal with a statement about um, privacy, um, mainly that um, privacy for emergency calls, and that would apply to data-only emergency calls, um, is subject to local regulation. And there, in many jurisdictions, there are regulations that basically reveal or uh, tell you that, that uh, certain uh, information that normally is considered private is at least shared with the emergency services people. So that is actually a meaningful statement. And we need to make sure that that's in the, conser in the consideration. So I put that in. Um, there was a reference to a draft that I put in that lets you do an update to additional data. We haven't worked on that draft for a while. And I decided to just take it out. That was just the easiest thing to progress this document. I eventually want to get back to that because some data, and specifically the data that you're using in the message, alarm data would be the example, may in fact change over time. Uh, we have another way to do it. You can send it by reference and then repeatedly dereference it. So we have a mechanism to, to do that, but a push mechanism is probably better. But I don't need to reference it. I don't need, I, we don't need that mechanism to make this useful. Um, and um, tying the two, the, the, those two drafts together is probably not a good idea, so I just took it out, just deleted the text. Um, and then I needed to make changes to conform to the, uh, the syntax that we have in the final version of additional data. Um, I, I was using some earlier syntax, and I fixed those. Those are the changes. We did do a working loose last call, um, but there, there was not a, a really a large amount of review. Um, and I did make changes, so the chairs agreed, well, the chairs decided that they would just rerun a, a, another last call, which is fine. Um, and and that's, what we, that's what they did. So we, we would appreciate a few reviews. I'm gonna get the NENA guys to, to, um, um, to, to do some reviews. Um, we're gonna deploy this in, in the NENA architecture of the next generation 911, so this is gonna have mul many in, interoperable implementations reasonably soon, I think. Um, and I would appreciate anybody taking a look at it and, and give me any feedback. Questions? This one's pretty simple and, and, and fairly mature. It's been, been around for a while. Have to deal with a lot of these little details, making sure exactly things are right, but it's, it's actually a pretty simple mechanism. How many people are following the draft Reddit, keeping up on what's going on? Again, plea for review. I'd really appreciate it if people would take a look at it. Wouldn't take you long. It's, it's right. a, not a long draft. Okay. Okay. That's it for data only. Oops. Similar. Or? Similar. Oh wow! We got two slides in this one. So similar gives you a way to return location information on a fine service response. So this is used in two circumstances. One, if you, if you have a valid location but you're missing some information, you can, that can occur when you send enough information in the location information in the lost request that we can uniquely identify of the location. But you may not have supplied enough information that the, that that, that, that we really like you to have in the location that you send when you, when you send that location an emergency call. Um, a great example would be you have, a, um, you have a street for which there really is only one such street with the right street house number and everything else. Everything else is the same, but you've misspelled or, or in some way mangled the, the, the city name. Um, another great example is that you, you, you you don't include the county or the A2 um, level information. The, the uh, 911 authorities, or the, I'm sorry, the emergency uh, uh, call authorities really would like to have all locations have that A2 information. And, but you've given us enough information. You know, there's only one city with that name in this state. Um, uh, and and uh, we can supply that information back. So it's complete. It gives you a complete, all the fields that we know about that location. Um, you, in that circumstance, you have sent a valid location in, so you're going to get a route out. Um, but 
uh, there's, there's information that we know and we want to be able to return it to you so you can save it and send it in the emergency call. Um, the, the, the second um, use is when you send an invalid location. So this is when you send a piece of information in, but we cannot lo uniquely locate you in the, in the lost database. You don't get a route in this case. You get an error and you get a, um, a, um, uh, uh, there's three uh, lists of uh, valid, invalid, and unchecked, and you, you know, the, the individual elements of location information are put in one of those three things. So in this case, what we're going to provide you with is a valid location. That is, uh, maybe you meant this. So this is a piece of helpful, po hopefully helpful information to a user who's entered the, an, an, an incorrect location. Um, we do, the, all the documents for all of this say that it's, it's highly desirable to validate the location before you have an emergency call, right? You want to make sure that your location is valid before you have to go and get a route for it. So this is going to get used way in advance. When you first get your service, you put in an, addr an address. If you put in an address that we can't, rec we can't validate, um, you need to figure out what the valid location is, and we're going to give you helpful information, give you a, a valid piece of information that's a, maybe you meant this. Um, it's exactly the same mechanism. It's just a way to return location information in the uh, find service response of a, of a lost uh, query. Next. Um, we have had several reviews on this document, um, and uh, I, I have updated the comment in response to those reviews. One of them was quite extensive, uh, an extensive review and, and um, gave me several very, very valuable comments, which I believe I have implemented virtually all of them. Um, I'm going to have that reviewer who's not here, Dan Banks, uh, look to make sure that I've done the right thing um, uh, as part of working group last call. Um, but uh, this has received a lot of interest from the Nina guys. They're real. Everybody's very, very interested in this, um, and uh, the mechanism is good for them. That everything's all right. So we would, um, again, we'll get a bunch of reviews from them. But anybody in the room who's willing to review it, this one's a little bit. You need to know Lost pretty well to kind of understand what this is doing. But um, if you if you're familiar with RFC 5222, then then the draft is actually fairly short, but uh, if you don't understand lost, you'll, you, you will get lost reading this document. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I had to say that, right? Um, so um, working group last call has actually started. Um, I, wrote, I wrote the uh, slides before they actually issued the working group last call, which is great. Um, um, which is unusual. He usually does it 10 minutes before. Yeah, right. Day. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's right. I had him several days in advance. Wow. Um, uh, but uh, I, 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 again, I, the, the mechanism is actually very simple, um, but uh, it, it's, um, it, it is something that could use some more review, okay? And finally, well, any questions? Are people paying attention to this draft? Yeah. We, we do. But it's I'm mostly asking, the Nina guys. We need reviews, right? Working group last call, yeah. that process, we're asking people to review it. See if yeah. they uh, agree with the mechanisms defined and actually look for editorial nits if you don't like you know, that stuff or yep. if you're keen on that stuff. We do need people to review these things. So is there anybody volunteering to do help us with a working group last call? Dale. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I will get a bunch of reviews okay. from from the from the Nina guys. They want this pretty bad, so I can bash them and get them to review it. <laughs> and finally, we have plan changes. So this one is a uh, a mechanism to deal with the re the reality that. Um, the data in the lost server changes slowly over time. An easy example is they build a new road in a, in a town, and we've got to add that, that piece of information. Um, a, another example is that a part of a, of, of a, um, an un, what we, in the U.S. it's called an unincorporated community. It's an area that is not in a city, but near a city, and the city expands its boundary to take that area in. We call that annexation. Um, there are other terms used in other countries, um, but uh, those changes 
are an actual change in the address. The address changes because instead of having the name of the community, the A4 level, um, uh, be you know like the county name or some neighborhood name, it changes to be the name of the city. Um, so what was valid is no longer valid. That's a planned change. These kinds of changes happen on a schedule. They say at midnight on this date, these things will change. Yes. Andrew, I'm just going to say we're in a city here that uh, 25 years ago had a lot of uh, planned uh, name changes. <laughs> yes, in, in, indeed it did. We're in a, in yes, a, in a city yes, that had a nar quite a number of planned changes. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so um, that, that mechanism uh, is, so that, that happens. Um, today, the only way that we have to, to have, uh, to communicate issues like this is that there's this statement in, in phone BCP that says you should validate periodically. You should revalidate periodically so that if you have a valid location. Every once in a while, you should check to make sure that it's still valid. Well, that's a really lousy way to handle a plan change. Um, the, the, the way this, so, so the whole mechanism, what that, that revalidate is a pull mechanism. And what this draft proposes is a push mechanism. It's a way to say, I'm going to tell you that these locations will become invalid at a, at a certain time or will change at a certain time. And the way we do that is that we, we save a URI in the lost server that we poke if you, if a change is, is going to be made. So when you do a, a, a validation request, you can supply a URI. That URI can be saved in the lost database. And whenever that location changes, that URI that you provided will be poked to tell you that that happens. It's all optional at the server. The server can have lots of control over what URIs it will or won't save. You are not guaranteed that URIs that you give it will be saved. You are not guaranteed that you can give them, you know, a, a, there's a limit on the size of the URI. You can only have one of them. For a given source, you know, there's lots of limits on what this this does, so that it doesn't overload anybody. But the the normal case is that there will only be one, two, or three maybe um, URIs against a given location of a finite size. Um, the other thing it does is it provides an input variable called as of that lets you ask the server, will this location that I gave you be valid as of this date? And that's a way to, to, to make sure that you can create, that when this plan change happens on a known schedule, that you can validate ahead of the change that your proposed new address will be valid as of the date of the change. So you can, you can, that you, you'll get this notification that says this is going to become invalid, you know, five days from now. You can, three days from that location, you can say, well, look, if I changed it to this, um, as of, you know, five days from now, five, four days from now, would it be valid? And then the, the server can say, yes, well, a as of that day, it will be valid. If you ask me about it today, it's invalid. In five days, it will be valid. Um, so um, the, the uh, draft has been around for a while. We did adopt it as a working group draft. Um, and uh, the, so, so I have issued a zero zero um, of, of draft ecrit. Um, it's uh, again a, a fairly simple mechanism, but if you don't understand how Lost works, once again, it's pretty hard to do. Basically, just adds this URI as an input parameter that you can save, uh, gives you an object that you can send to that URI to tell you that it's, a change has been made, and gives you this as of thing that lets you say, will it be valid as of a specific date? Um, this is a real problem encountered by real implementations that they know they're going to have. And it also deals with a, a fact that we discovered in an implementation, which is that because phone BCP says periodically revalidate, the number of transactions on the lost server that are revalidations is two or three orders of magnitude more than the number of other operations on the loss server. So the loss servers has to be scaled much, much, much larger just because of that periodic revalidation. We'd like to turn that pull notion into a push mechanism so that we can reduce the load on the loss server. It's really the, the validation part of the loss server. So that's the deployment experience tells us 
we made a mistake. Um, periodic revalidation is causing a lot of load that we didn't anticipate. Um, and we, we'd like to turn that mechanism around and make it push. Um, so uh, we have not had very many reviews on this. I'm, I'm asking for a bunch of reviews. Um, once again, I will go to the NINA guys because they they're the ones with the problem here. Um, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate people, people looking at it and give me some reviews. Yes, Randall. Randall Gellens. Um, so I did look at the draft, but it was a while ago, and I, I don't remember a lot about it. Um, so refresh. Um, so the intent of the way this is going to be used, is this going to be used by random clients out in the world every time they want to uh, no. validate? It's used or by is the this list. Infrastructure to infrastructure kind yeah, of use. It's the list operator will to use this. So and then there'll be some kind of security language in there about, you know, not allowing the saved URI to be a, a, a source of uh, malware, spin, yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it has, well, I mean, it's just a URI. So you, 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 it, you don't retrieve anything from that URI. You only, you only do a post to that URI. Right, but right? you don't so, want to let any arbitrary person give you. Yeah, there's, there's, you should look at the text, the security. Okay. The security considerations is an important part of this particular document. Um, and, and I've tried to think through, make sure that we can't, you can't get a, a malicious, you know, it, it helps that you can only post, right? The, there's, no, there's no data you're getting back. But nonetheless, you could get a, you know, you could get a, uh, an error, you know, it could be, no, it could well, be nowhere. You could, you could cause some innocent party to be sending out Sure, that's why you limit the number, right? So that you can't, do, it's, not, it's not a way to do an amplification attack. Um, uh, you, will, you will poke, you know, you will try to push a piece of document to some things. Yes, the, 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 you, you would like to know who, who is requesting this. You have their, you would like to, have, you should have a policy. And I'm pretty sure I talk about this. I, maybe I'll have to go back and look at what I wrote about this, but, um, the identity, you, your actions at the server should reflect the identity of the entity who's asking for it. But the, and the idea then this is infrastructure, infrastructure, but there'll be one of these, potentially one of these saved URIs per requester, per location, per saved validated address. Right, but, but think about as, again, in a pl practical thing, the, the number of lists with the same address is gonna be, you know, one, two, three, it's how many. Sure, how many but, so access you know, providers there are for that address. You've got the equivalent of the of the MSAG and you've got some large number of addresses in there. Yeah. And so you're gonna have some number of these per every single yeah. validator yeah. address. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that's again in the in the scale of databases, that's that's pretty small. As long as there's really only three of them, right? If there were five thousand of them per record, then maybe it would be a a concern, and 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 there is definitely advice about you know limit how many of these you handle. Any other questions or comments? I think I'm done. Reviews again, same with this. There are three easy drafts to read. Uh, we put them in working group last call, so we're asking for people to review them, and obviously we'll go to the list with that also. This one first, Randy? You're next. Is this one first? Oh, you can't see that, can you? Huh. Maybe if I do this. And the full screen is. So actually version 10 uh, of the eCall document was uh, published today. Uh, so that is now available. Uh, the major changes since version seven, which was the, the last real big revision, um, in order to align with some work that went on in 3GPP, 
Uh, the MSD is now uh, transported using uh, uh, ASN.1 PER encoding, which is a binary encoding. It's not no longer in XML. Um, and furthermore, um, there's a mid-call. So normally in e-call, um, the vehicle sends the, the MSD uh, in the initial invite, and then the PSAP sends a response acknowledging that in the, re the reply to the invite, and normally that's it. Uh, but there are cases where PSAP might want to request an updated MSD mid-call. So the way that happens is the PSAP sends uh, an info message to the vehicle um, and says, please send me an MSD. <clears throat> Before the tech said that the vehicle would send that reply MSD in the reply to the info, now the vehicle sends a new info message with the uh, requested MSD in it. Um, the info package uh, template was filled out with some more text, um, uh, added an example that showed info, and then one of the other big changes is that uh, because the e-call draft creates the mechanism uh, with this control object and so forth um, that's reused by the car crash draft, um, there were some items in the um, metadata control object that were used for car crash that were not necessary for e-call. So by request, those were all moved out of the e-call document and put into the car crash document as extensions. Uh, so that's, and then there are a lot of editorial changes, um, and um, I guess we can go on to the next slide, I think which talks about where I got comments from, yes. So we got a lot of comments from a number of people um, and I want to thank all of them. Uh, we had a lot of uh, editorial changes resulting from that, and then the big uh, technical changes that I mentioned before. Um, I want to thank Krista especially for spending a lot of time. I think we've got things in a really good shape now. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so there's really just two open issues remaining. One is uh, related to what I mentioned just a second ago about moving uh, the stuff that wasn't directly needed for e-call uh, from the e-call document to the car crash. And one of those is a capabilities element that gets sent from the vehicle to the PSAP to let the PSAP know what the vehicle's capabilities are so the PSAP will not request anything that the vehicle does not support. So there was a, a suggestion to move that capabilities object back into the e-call document but make it optional so that if the vehicle does not send a capabilities uh, object, it means its capabilities are the minimum set required for e-call in the e-call document. But then the car crash would uh, then make the capabilities uh, mandatory. The other open issue is about the use of, uh, about the info package registration. Right now the e-call document says that the e-call, I'm sorry, the info package uh, can be used to send uh, a, a body part, a MIME type, that's listed in the emergency call data set. Um, and so there's been some debate about whether that's legal per the info document. Um, if it is legal, everything's cool. If it's not legal, then we have a few options. One option is that um, one option is that we require, because the purpose of, of making this uh, a registry instead of a list, a static list, is that the way this gets extended is that, like we've seen right now, for, for e-call, we have the MSD, which is the data set from the vehicle to the PSAP for, for pan-European e-call. In North America, we have a different data set, VEDS. So potentially, other regions, as they start uh, coming up with um, uh, implementations of this general mechanism, will start defining their own data sets. And if we want to do that, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to simply define the MIME type for this uh, data set without having to go through a lot of work, publish an RFC, and so forth. So one option would be that we require a new info package registration that would include everything in the earlier ones uh, for every new MIME type that might get deployed in a different region. Another option, which is kludgier but avoids the legalistic argument, would be that we um, don't use info. We use reinvite or options or something like that, uh, but some other SIP message that doesn't have the legalistic restrictions. A third option is that we define, and this is also ugly and a kludge, but perfectly legal, I think. You define a um, <clears throat> a MIME type that that says multi-part um, emergency services data, 
and then uh, you put a parameter in there. And what you do is you just, only for info, you just take your actual mind type and cram it into this multi part as an extra wrapper around it so that the info package only has the one mind type. It's horribly ugly, but it would get around the, um, the wording of the info package restriction. So there you have it. Krista uh, Holmberg. Yes, first of all, I, I, I also like to thank you for, we've given a lot of comments and uh, things which came out from 3DPP, uh, other comments that you had and things have gone very smoothly, but as you said, there are, there are, there are a few open issues. I think there's one more issue uh, than this also, which was raised by my colleague, which we were discussing offline, was this usage of content ID and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and call in for, but, but uh, I think the, but that's the, the main issue is this info and, and I, I'll try to be short, but I mean, we had this previously, we had this legacy info before we did info packages and there were a lot of problems with that. People used it for all kinds of things. There were no real semantics associated with it. You didn't really know what people supported and what they were gonna do when they received this. So, so we defined the info package which has all the semantics. And, 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 and one thing which this info package does say is that you define which MIME types are associated with which this info package. Now the way it's done here in eCall is a different. Instead of listing these MIME times, it says that you can use any MIME times, any MIME type which exists in this uh, specific IANA registry. So whenever people want to use something new, they don't need to define a new info package, they just add stuff into this INI registry. And that is my main issue because I think, for, first of all, it's, it, I mean, we don't know in, in the long run what people are gonna put there as long as they can justify it as somehow being you know, emergency related. And another example, or I also think it gives a bad precedence. I've given an example, I will give it here, I don't know if it's the best one, but assume that someone registers an info package for uh, transporting, you know, game, online game information, and they create IANA, IANA registry for online game MIME types. Then we start getting all these games, 10 games, 100 games, 200 games. They all define their own MIME type, and they all put this into the same registry and use the same info package. So I think it's, it's, it's a slippery slope and a dangerous way to go. So my suggestion is really, and I think that this original intention of info package, when you need something new, you define a new info package. I said here earlier, you mentioned RFC, but that's not true. You don't need an RFC to define a new info package. It's specification required and an expert review so you can define it wherever you want. Any, 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 you know, the Chinese, the Americans, whatever they define this, the, it can be done. Uh, so, and info packages are, 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 are cheap in, in that sense. So I really think that should be done. We list explicitly the info packages and these are the mind times you use and nothing else. Uh, also what's important to think that this is not only about the mind times, another thing which we have in the info package is a section where you need to either define or reference a specification which describes how this uh, info package is used. And that of course includes how the MIME types are used. So now, assuming that you're adding a new MIME type to this registry which is coming into this info package, you would also have to update this, add a reference to the specification which now describes the usage of this MIME type and so on. And maybe it could be doing something else, maybe it could affect some of the other things which are in, in, the, in, in the info package, rate, whatever we have, I mean, we don't know. So then you would have to update the info package and there is really no procedure for updating the info package, the actual template that has been provided to IANA. There is no, no mechanism for that. So my suggestion, and I, I have said offline, I am willing to help whatever I can do to do that, is we define this info package for eCall, for e -crash, cars crash, sorry, they, we define a, another info package. We can use similar name, no problem. We can even, it's a lot of copy paste we can do. And then for, you know, 
Asia, whoever needs, they, they do it there in for packages. I think that's a clean way, easy way. You know exactly what is there. You don't need to go and look in, in this rigid industry where there's something new stuff there, even though, and, and so on. And uh, I think that's a generic way to do it. I know that there is these capabilities. In this specific case, there are mechanisms that we have done uh, so we can know what's supported. But I don't think that way we should go that individual info packages start defining their own negotiation me mechanism. That, that's not what we should do. There is a common negotiation mechanism which you, when you send your invite, you include this receive info header field which names the info package. If I support this info package and I know which MIME ties are associated, I, everything is good. So I really think that, uh, I strongly think we should do that here also. Sorry for, for you know. Uh, yeah. You got it, thank you. But, uh, <laughs> and I, 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 again, I, I didn't want to come up here and say that I don't appreciate, I really appreciate the work that's been done. I, I'm really thankful for that. I think we've lot, got done a lot of progress, but this is the main issue where we unfortunately are not on, on, on the same page. Uh, Brian Rosen. Um, uh, the, when you add a new block of data, all we're doing is adding a piece of data, right? It's an, a hunk of XML that we're sending between the entities, right? We, we need to decide what level of review is appropriate to add a piece of data using the mechanism we're providing. If we decide that specification review is the right level, a specification required is the right level of documentation to add a new thing, then adding to the registry should have specification required. If we decide that that's not an appropriate level of documentation, it's too much overhead for the, for the kind of information that we have, then maybe we would go back to just an expert review. By requiring that you were doing a new info package, you are demanding that you do specification required. That might be what we want, but it isn't a decision that we're making. It's just you got to do it that way because that's what information, what, 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 what info says. It is low overhead. We can build a template that says to do an info package, you know, fill in these blanks, done. So it's not a huge, it's not a huge amount of overhead. Specification required is more than, you know, a, 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 a expert review and other things. You got to, it's a, well, if you read the definition of standards required, it's a lot more than just document required. <laughs> Krista, I'm not talking about standard required. What, I, what, what uh, maybe I remember the definition. Maybe I remember the definition of specification required wrong. But my what I what 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 is needed is there needs to be a publicly available document, which the expert reviewer can because the expert reviewer needs to you know look at this. It doesn't have to be an RFC. It doesn't have to be an RFC. Exactly. So, yeah. Specification just means specification. You, you have it there in front of you. Yes. It's not a standard. It does not have to have consensus. It just has to be written down. Yes. Something that they yeah, I mean, to be obviously. I, yeah. I, I, right. So, but, but all I'm saying, I mean, just for reinforcing the same thing, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just going to repeat it, right? We need to decide what the level of control that we want over adding another hunk of data. If we decide that specification required is appropriate, Great, let's do that. By pushing my requiring info, we don't get to make that, we, we get to make it stronger, right? We can say, and adding something to the registry takes more than specification required. I don't think we're gonna do that, but we could. But it, we're, we're stuck at the minimum level of specification required, which may or may not be appropriate. I happen to think it's not appropriate, but we can, we can, we can make that decision independently. However, I am not in favor of playing games with the, uh, the SIP info package RFC, right? If, if, it, if the SIP guys say, no, you can't do that, he's right. You gotta specify what MIME types go in the package. That's the end of the story, we're gonna do it. And just to, heard, in my opinion. For a point of interest, the chairs are trying to solicit help to look at that and just make that decision too, outside of this community, right? Robert. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Andrew Allen. Yeah, I have a lot of sympathy for Krista's uh, points here. I think you know, the reason we did all this work to come up with uh, with the new version of Info with the Info packages was to prevent the kind of proprietary explosion of the use of Info, which Info, which meant it didn't interoperate 
And I feared if we had these add MIME types that are outside of the control of the actual package, that effectively you've got different versions of the same package that aren't going to interoperate. Um, as Brian said, I think we can make this a template. You can be very clear. We put that in the RFC. Uh, this is a template. If you want to uh, add a add a new uh, a new usage, then this is how you do it. This is how you create the at the what you would put in your specification. You just fill in the blanks. So if I could actually just play devil's advocate for a moment, um, I I think I very well understand the concern that you guys have about the reason there's info package and the reason the requirements and how um, allowing us to do this could potentially create a slippery slope that allows you know the game people to to just go haul wild with completely different types of data with completely different semantics and and so forth and that would be a mess um, but just to play devil's advocate if I was a game designer trying to do that sort of thing I could easily do that with info now um, several different ways. I could define one MIME type and just say this MIME type contains XML or JSON or whatever, and then I put whatever I want in there that has wildly different semantics and sizes and rates and everything else. Yeah, this is uh, uh, this is Hannes. Yeah, I think uh, the the case that Krista uh, provided here, sort of the worry, seems a little bit constructed. Um, like. The fact that you come up with gaming, the gaming community is is uh, is. <laughs> no, no, it's it's like it's like is this a real concern? Like, literally, the gaming community of writing zip applications and then putting stuff into the emergency services. You must be kidding, right? No, he's not <laughs> saying they would use emergency services. He's saying they would uh, use I, I, the, what we did. I said that they would define they would define their own IANA registry for for gaming mind types. And, they, and then they would have one single info package which points to that registry. And then everyone starts putting these, these MIME types into the same registry, and it all gets associated with one single info package. I, di I didn't say that they were going to use the emergency IANA registry, but they were going to do something sim similar with their own, own uh, uh, registry. Basically, allowing you to have one info package, and then people can start adding, adding, adding MIME types into that. That's what I want to avoid. And, and of course, you know, anyone can define an XML type, which is very flexible. And we can't prevent that. But I mean, but, but I mean that's not a reason for us to, to, do, to do, you know, the wrong thing just by saying, yeah, but someone else could do this. Let, you know, we, we, do, we should do what's right. And, and, you know, that's all we can sure. do. But, but the, if the reason to make, if the reason for us to do something in a more difficult way which isn't the semantics that we want, is to prevent us from being um, um, a precedent for somebody else to do the wrong thing. Even without us being that precedent, the people who want to do the wrong thing can do the wrong thing. Chris, I, I don't think it's easier because even, even, even if we would move forward this way, there would be a lot of text needed. We need text either an update to RFC 6086 or something describing how this is done. Yes, you can create these registers and all these things. And, and, and we need rules, how it's done, how do you in, update the info package. There would be a lot of, of, of work, not for you maybe, because this would be maybe for me. So I, I, I think <laughs> that defining new C packages is, is really the easiest way to do it. It, it, you need to write a little text, but then it's done and it's clear, and, and no one has any, any, any you know, it's no uh, ambiguity. Okay, so, so, so just a time check. We got like six minutes, and he's got to be get through this one in that six minutes, too. So, um, Georg I'm uh, working with 3GPP as well, and I also support Krista. I think if we create a precedence here, I mean, when we're looking at the SIP protocol in uh, 3GPP, there are people who look if there are any holes where they can sneak something in. What you're doing here, and I'm not a fan of that, at least not when I'm here in this meeting. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> from being too bad. No, I, I, I just think we should go along the lines that the SIP info protocol uh, message was intended to. And we had long debates in 3GPP as well, how we can use info. And we are very restrictive in this usage. And I hope we can also be that here. 
and not open some doors that maybe I mean, if somebody wants to misuse info and cram stuff in, like I said, there's plenty of ways to do it that, that don't violate the letter of the RFC. <laughs> Andrew Allen. Well, I, I would hope that the expert reviewer of the info package would at least catch some of those. Um, if, if it looks like you're just basically creating a generic container to stuff in whatever you like. I mean, as Georg said, in FreeGPP, we could create an info package called FreeGPP application and just like put everything in the future, never have to come back to ITF again. This is not what we want to encourage. So, and I don't think it's really that hard. Pretty much we can fill out the whole template in the RFC as a registration template. And you just need an identifier. You just need to fill in this bit and this bit and this bit. We will have two. We'll have two examples, right? One for equal, and one for one it, for car crash, and uh, it shouldn't be that difficult. Well, but the issue isn't with what we do for ECOV and car crash. The issue is what does the next region that might need like a so. MSD is one set of data. In North America, we're using VEDS, which is a pretty flexible set of data. But what happens if China or Australia or Saudi Arabia or some other region or country decides they want something that isn't quite VEDS, they want their own data set? So what the RFC, what the, the documents say now is, well, you define a MIME type and you add it to the registry and everything else is exactly the same. So we're gonna say, in addition to the MIME type, you're gonna have to have a specification for the info package. Which, as Brian points out, specification is just a document. Right? Requires it. I'm sorry. The specification is just a document. That's all it is. A publicly available document. And following that template, so we provide them a template, mm -hmm. and we identify. Okay, here, fill out your own stuff. Fill out your own stuff. Um, it doesn't seem that it's a huge piece of documentation. And basically, we want good documentation so we can implement that thing without having to go through all kinds of hoops and hurdles in order to find out what it is. Yes, Chris, exactly. So, so, so the Saudis will have to define their own info package, and I don't think that's an issue. And I mean, no matter what, what is the, I assume they're going to document it somewhere in some document, right? So, so no matter how it's done, they're just, they're just not, not going to send an email to Ayana and, and hey, hey, here is our MIME type, and then it's not documented anywhere. I mean, it, 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 and, and I don't think even, I don't know what the IETF procedures for registering new MIME types are, but I, I would assume that that's not going to pass either. Just someone saying, please, please register this MIME type without any inf indication what's in it. So they will have to define an info package. They, you know, write it down and it's, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, it's not that too much information that you need to provide. The, the, the real, the real stuff is is how you use it, and that they will have to define it somewhere else. And the expert reviewer will look at that, and and the info package template with reference to that, and everything is good. Okay, so let's get through this real quick. Sure. I, I want okay. I want well, my I, I want my five minute discussion. Okay. At the end. Well, actually, there's there's really very little to say on this. Okay. Um, you know. It's it's just the mirror of it. I mean, the stuff that came out of eCall uh, was moved. The, the eCall metadata control object was moved in here. Um, there are a lot of editorial changes, and I think that's it. So once we decide whether we're moving the um, the capabilities object, whether we're leaving it here or moving it back into eCall, so it forms like part of the base spec for the extension here. Um, that's really the only open issue that affects uh, this document. Uh, Brian Rosen, in the interest of fairness, I just looked up the registration requirements for MIME type, and it's more onerous than specification required. Well, it, it depends. <laughs> Correct. It, it depends on which. Well, right. It depends on which tree we allow it to be. Right. Make. And what we've, it's, right. It, 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 we, we, we probably need to specify that if we allow it to be in the vendor tree. So. <laughs> All right, if we, if we have comments, please use the mic. If we don't have comments, then we're done here. Thanks, Randy. Oh, Dale, one quick one. It's got to be quick. Well, what I was saying off the microphone, Andrew Allen again, um, is at least for public safety applications in different regions, I would hope they wouldn't be in the vendor tree. I'm sorry? For public safety applications, mm -hmm. like car crash, I hope they wouldn't be in the vendor tree. Right, right, absolutely not. And particularly because what we're really talking about here is, is very, it's not just public safety, we're talking about vehicle-initiated emergency calls 
and we're talking about region-specific data sets for them, car manufacturers would probably want to implement this, all of the regions in the same vehicle so that the vehicle just knows what to send based, based on where it is. Uh, you wouldn't, couldn't do that in the vendor tree. I mean, you wouldn't want to. Uh, Brian Rosen, so, so that's a comment to change the text to say that. Um, it's uh, too late, but we should have probably done that with additional data. Um, and having said that, um, it's specification required from a recognized standards organization. So I think uh, we actually have an out on that, though, because it's uh, not just uh, that you have to register a MIME type, but you also need expert review for the IANA registry, I believe. Okay. Thanks, Randy. So we're going to go back to what we talked about originally, which was basically the document status. So we have we have no individual drafts hanging out there targeted at ECRIT, right? So nobody has submitted anything for a while. Uh, we have these five drafts that are on the screen that are that are three of them we called working group last call this week, second working group last call and a couple of those. Okay, so we're, we're getting to the point where our work is winding down. And when we submitted the request to have a meeting at IETF 96, there was 25 meeting requests more than they had space for. So my point I'm getting to is we're almost, if, if we don't start wrapping up some of this and winding down and keep asking for meeting slots, we're gonna start doing the IETF a disservice by you know, taking a meeting slot where and there's a work group that really does need to meet. So I, I'm encouraging people to review the working group last call documents. Uh, so we don't have, basically don't have to meet, you know, in Seoul. I mean, I, I, Alyssa's gonna, you know, overpower me in any way, shape or form, but we gotta get through these issues that between and the car crash and e-call, I think those are not insurmountable issues. I think if we, you know, pay attention to those and, and, and work through it, we can get those documents done prior to, to Seoul. So, I mean, that's, that's from a chair position, that's what I, would like people to to start working on. Um, Brian Rosen, I, I mean, I certainly agree with with what you said. I'm, I'm, we, we put November down for you put November down, and I'm hopeful that we can meet that. Um, but I think um, we had November a couple of years ago on it too. Yeah, so. I, I understand. It, it depends on reviews. It depends on reviews. I'm going to work hard to get reviews so that we can do those things. But I do believe that we that there is more work to do. And that more work is a result of deployment experience that we're, we're having. I know of at least two things that we want to do. Um, so I, I, you know, they can be done as individual drafts. We can do it. You know, we can leave the mailing list open. I understand all those kinds of things, but I think it would be good. I think it would be better to leave the working group open for a while um, uh, to, 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 to do the, those additional pieces of work. Okay. That's Thank, thanks for the warning. Obviously, what we have to view is submission for doc, you know, drafts is what we look at, so. So I think, I mean, I would hope that all of these documents are with the ISG before the next meeting. If um, the only, the gating factor is that this is a small group of people who need to review all of them or who are, are the likely candidates to review all of them, but um, that would be my expectation for this. Um, but I think the other thing about this group is that there's, there's very little overhead in keeping the group open and keeping the mailing list um, and just having it sit there uh, if, even if there's no work for a while, um, there's no reason to close it if in, for this particular topic, it seems like things might pop up now and again. Um, and I think that that's fine. We don't, we can sort of be in dormant state um, and that doesn't cost us anything. So that would, that would be my recommendation is that after we get through uh, the rest of these that we go into, go into dormant state and then people can always ping the list with new things as, as they come up. And if, you know, a year goes by or something and we change our minds, we can we can close the group or just keep the list or we have a lot of options. So right. that's yeah, my suggestion. I, I think my point was more around taking precious precious minute time or meeting time at the you know at the meetings for face to face. You don't have to when, meet when this should be done by then. I in don't. general, a working group who's all of whose 
documents our interwarden group last call doesn't usually meet unless there's like comments coming back from the right. ISG. So yeah, I, I don't want to be discussing info packages in November and Seoul. <laughs> well, we need to go to the list, but yeah, we we're, we're trying to get some expert review on that. But so that that's the chair's piece for the people that made notes. Are you subscribers to the ECRIT list? Do you? Okay. So I'll get with you as soon as we to, to get the notes from you. So, um. Andrew Allen, just one comment on the slide, Mark. Um, Pre-GPP is working requirements for like service. I think it is the same service. E call. I'm sorry. For the e call. Just a comment on the wording of the slide. Oh, okay. It really is. There isn't the IETF e call, and the free, this was a point that Keith made. And the Pre-GPP e call. There's a single service. Well, e but. Weren't we, Alyssa, aren't we still holding this draft until we get hard requirements or if we ever see requirements out of 3GPP? Well, I, I think his point is just that we basically did this for that for the service being developed in 3GPP. We wrote the draft here for that, so okay. it's just one service. But um, I mean, I guess, the but I'm assuming the timing on that is like we basically know everything. Like if we resolve these last couple open issues, we can go to one group last call and go to ITF last call and that will be okay for 3GPP, is that correct? I think so, just one thing. Um, we have a meeting, well, we have a meeting next week and we have two more meetings, one of which clashes with the sole meeting um, to get this done for release 14, so. Okay, but, uh, I mean, the, I don't but. Know exactly what, what might get done now and then. Okay, but it's possible that new new requirements will still be popping up from 3GPP in November? Well, but, but still, I mean, you're going to... Yeah. I think the work is going to... It's already pretty stable uh, as far as, as, as the 3D PP work is concerned. Obviously they reference and we have all these open issues and I know they have a meeting next week so they're gonna be, they're gonna be, but I, I think it's, I, I'd say it's, it's, there are no main issues. I mean, we, okay. we found issues at previous meeting but those have, those have all been taken care of. So I, I had to say things were much, went much smoother than I thought, so. Okay, so, but you, you remember the original idea we were going to run it through IETF last call and before Alyssa hit the pub request button we were going to check back to see if there's anything else we needed we hadn't covered from 3GPP perspective yeah. so I mean we can still follow that but if, if if you know something that says we don't have to deal with that anymore then you know please please let us know okay yeah I wouldn't say we're quite there right now but I guess we could also initiate as well right we could we could liaise to IETF that uh, we creep from Fridge BP and say, we think this is good now, so don't hold it anymore. Or if you're waiting on us, then send us a, a communication and we'll we'll get back to you. Okay, we we are officially three minutes over. Bits and bites is opening up and there's gonna be free food and beer, so I don't want to spend that long. Thank you everybody. Oh, thank you.